Do you enjoy playing a commander that adopts a control strategy using many unique and unplayed cards? Do you enjoy playing a commander that gets more from their removal than almost any other? Do you enjoy playing a commander that can swing the tempo of a game with the resolution of a single spell? Then Hanada Dawncrowned may just be the commander you've been looking for. Before we begin, let's just flesh out what Hanada is doing for us. Hanada Dawncrowned is a 4-4 Kirin spirit that costs 1 generic, a blue, a red, and a white mana. It has Trample and Flying and says, Spells you cast cost 1 generic less to cast for each target, and spells your opponents cast cost 1 generic more to cast for each target. So Hanada wants to reward us by casting spells that have multiple targets, and it wants to punish our opponents when they cast their spells that target. Now as you can imagine, the amount of spells in these colours that target is enormous, so we need a way to narrow down our choices. That is where establishing our win cons come in. If we are going to be taking advantage of Hanada and casting spells with multiple targets, what they will all have in common is a high mana value cost, even if we aren't actually paying that much mana. So we will want win cons that can take advantage of that fact. Let's start off with Dika, Fractal Theorist, who will make us Fractal Tokens that come in with counters based on the mana value of the instants and sorceries we cast. Now we will get to them soon, but let's just say the cards this deck will be casting won't have trouble paying 1 to 3 mana to make tokens with counters ranging from 5 to 15, sometimes more. Dika also provides a way to make those tokens unblockable, so we can get the damage through. 4 mana is a hefty cost to pay for the effect, but when we can make tokens with 15 power, it becomes worth it. Metallurgic Summonings is similar to Dika, but makes XX Artifact Construct tokens instead. It also has a very relevant and useful ability to return all instants and sorceries from our graveyard to our hand, as long as we have 6 or more artifacts. When our graveyard is getting full from all the spells we will be casting, it is great to be able to get them all back to hand if the game goes longer. And because we are a control deck, our plan is for the game to go longer. Manaform Hellkite makes us XX Flying Dragon Illusion tokens with haste every time we cast a non-creature spell, but they do get exiled at the beginning of the next end step. So while we don't get to keep the tokens, which is definitely a big downside, this will be a card that is sneakily good in many games because of how high the mana value of our cards can get. Casting a big X spell and our opponents having no answer for the token then and there could mean an opponent dying that turn. Shark Typhoon will make us XX flying shark tokens every time we cast a non-creature spell. And unlike Manaform Hellkite, we get to keep our flying tokens, which is important because many times the flying evasion will mean the difference between killing an opponent or not. In more dire circumstances, it also has a cycling ability to make a shark, but we don't want to do this unless absolutely necessary because this is arguably the best token making win con in the deck. Speaking of token making win cons, our last one is Zaphi, Thunder Conductor, who rewards us depending on the mana value of the instants and sorceries we cast. If it's 4 or less, we scry 1. If it's 5 or more, we make a 4-4 elemental token as well as scrying. And if it's 10 or more, we deal 10 damage to an opponent randomly, in addition to making the token and scrying. So many times you will at the very least get the 4-4 elemental and scry with each spell you cast, based on the spells we are running. But it won't be uncommon to get the 10 damage effect as well, depending on the board state and how many things we can target. Overall Zaphi can provide a lot of value if it can stick, especially as the game goes longer and life totals begin to drop. It will also be our answer to effects that prevent combat damage from occurring. Crackle with power is another answer we have if combat damage can't get it done. Hanada will essentially reduce 1x from its casting cost, so if we pay, say, 4 into the X and 2 red, so 10 mana in total, this will deal 20 damage to up to 4 targets. If we have access to a lot of mana in one turn, this can just end the game if it resolves. Surge to Victory is our last win con for the deck and a card that, as of making this video, I have seen no one play, yet have always personally loved since I first saw it released. And I can sort of understand why. It's a card that has some tension because it asks you to go wide, but also to run big instants and sorceries to take advantage of it. Fortunately, I think this deck is where we can really make it shine, but let's read it first. Surge to Victory says, Exile target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard. Creatures you control get plus x plus zero until end of turn, where x is that card's mana value. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player this turn, copy the exiled card. You may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So this is definitely a powerful effect, but how powerful it is depends on the cards we exile with it. Now I want you to remember that at the very least, our commander should be able to get one trigger because of its inbuilt evasion and trample. But because we haven't gone over the cards just yet, 
I want you to keep this card in mind as we go forward and you will understand why it has a place in the deck. It's the kind of card that will create moments that make you realize why you love this game so much. So those are the main ways that our deck will win. Now let's move on to how we can gain and maintain card advantage. Archmage Emeritus draws a card every time we cast an instant or sorcery card. Because of Hanada's cost reduction ability on our targeted spells, most of them will cost 1 to 3 mana, so Archmage should draw us a steady supply of cards as the game progresses. Commander's Insight draws us cards based on how much we pay into X and also how many times we have cast our commander that game. But because it also specifies target player, with Hanada out, the floor will be pay 3 blue, draw 2 cards, which is a respectable rate to pay for an instant speed draw spell. The ceiling, however, is much higher. Disorder in the Court exiles creatures and creates clue tokens based on how many were exiled, then returns those creatures at the beginning of the next end step. So this card serves multiple purposes. The clues provide card advantage when we need it, but the blinking can also serve to protect us if someone is swinging big or remove key creatures that may be part of a combo engine. We also run some powerful ETB effects in the deck which we will get to later, so it serves an important role there too. Drowning Dreams can become pay 1 blue and X to draw X cards at instant speed with Hanada out, and choosing to mill ourselves can be quite reasonable and even desirable, as we run 6 recursion pieces in the deck. Esper Sentinel is simply an efficient source of card draw, drawing us a card every time an opponent casts their first non-creature spell each turn and doesn't pay X, where X is Esper Sentinel's power. That alone is enough to warrant its inclusion, but because we also run some clone effects and cards that blink for protection, Esper Sentinel provides additional synergy with other cards in the deck. Expansion Explosion is a card that has several uses. With Hanada out, we get an immediate cost reduction of 2 on the Explosion side of the card, drawing us X cards and dealing X damage to any target, making this a card draw and interaction spell. But we can also use it for its expansion side, helping in a counter or removal war, and even copying an opponent's value spell like a Cultivate. It is a card that in this deck remains relevant and powerful at all points in the game. Inscription of Insight, again, like Expansion Explosion, serves multiple roles. With our commander in play, kicking this spell can cost 5 mana to bounce 2 creatures, scry 2 then draw 2, and make an XX Illusion token based on the number of cards in our hand. Yes, this is sorcery speed, and that can be a downside in many situations, but the value generated from this one spell makes it worthy of inclusion. Magma Opus has several roles, and hopefully you can start to see a trend here, where we are running cards that pull double duty and give us extra value in multiple lines of play. We can cast this for just 2 mana to tap 2 permanents, deal 4 damage divided amongst 4 targets, and draw 2 cards, which will be a great play to make in someone's upkeep, denying them mana if we anticipate a spell incoming, most likely their commander. But we can also use it to tap down any attackers that may be threatening our life total or commander damage total. Mystic Confluence can be a counter and bounce spell in addition to card draw, depending on what we need at the time. And being able to do so for potentially 2 mana makes this a very worthy inclusion. Mystic Remora is simply a great source of card advantage at a low cost, and will keep us fueled and ready with answers, especially if we encounter another control player at the table who runs many non-creature spells. Open Into Wonder can make our creatures unblockable, helping to end a game if our board is strong enough, but it can also simply draw us cards based on how many creatures deal combat damage. But not only this, if we have one of our win cons out that cares about the mana values of the spells we cast, we just target our opponent's creatures in addition to ours to make X, and hence the creature token it generates, huge. So this card serves to be a game finisher, card draw source, and huge token maker all in one. And don't forget, if you are desperate, you can take out a dangerous opponent by making another opponent's creatures unblockable. Yes, they will draw a lot of cards, but sometimes desperate times call for desperate measures. Paradoxical Outcome can bounce as many of our non-land, non-token permanents as we want to our hands to draw that many cards, meaning this serves as a card draw and protection spell. Imagine an opponent casting a board wipe, us paying just one blue to save all our relevant stuff and drawing that many cards in preparation for the next turn. Ristic Study, like Mystic Remora, is simply an efficient and powerful source of card draw to keep our hands full and ahead of the other control players. Whirlwind of Thought can definitely keep our hands full if it sticks, as our deck has 51 non-creature spells as of recording, and Hanada will make it easy to cast multiple spells in a turn cycle. Our last card in this section is Soulfire Eruption, which will be card advantage, interaction, and possibly a win con if it resolves. For just 3 mana, this can exile a large number of cards from our library, damage the targets based on their mana values, and allow us to play those cards until the end of our next turn. We don't have a particularly low curve in this deck due to our synergies and cost reductions with Hanada, 
so it is very likely a good number of the creatures we target will be taken out. Not only this, but we only need one deck at the table to be going wide for this to be a exile 10 to 20 cards and have them available to our next turn. Cast in the mid to late game, this card is a game ender and will also be a lot of fun to resolve due to its random nature of revealing cards. So that is our card advantage package. Now it is quite a lot, but because the cards that Hanada breaks are the interactive cards, and we want to keep our hands full to be able to keep casting them over the course of a game, we had to cut back on our Mana Acceleration package in preparation for the long game. So let's go over those. Arcane Signet has been included to help fix our colours, as some of our spells require 3 pips of the one colour, which can be hard to achieve early in a 3 colour deck. Dockside Extortionist is a powerful mana ritual on its own, but between our clone and protection spells, most of which happen to be flicker effects, we can abuse its ETB effect to generate a lot of mana and close out the game. Goldspan Dragon might cost 5 mana, but it can generate essentially 2 mana the turn it comes down, which we can use to hold up for interaction, or we can use it as one of our targets for the many spells we play that target, generating mana every time we cast a spell. Liquid Metal Torque is a colourless generating mana rock that has an important ability besides generating mana. It can turn any non-land permanent we target into an artifact until end of turn. This will come in handy when we need to remove a non-artifact non-land permanent, but only have artifact removal in hand. Mana Drain pulls double duty as a counter spell and a mana ritual, but we can also pull a very powerful trick with it. If we are looking to storm off next turn, or need access to a lot of mana to cast Crackle with Power for example, we can cast one of our X spells for a large mana value in an opponent's end step, counter it with our Mana Drain, and have access to potentially 10 to 20 colourless mana the next turn. And one of those cards that Mana Drain could target is Reality Spasm, where for 2 mana we can tap or untap X target permanents. This card can be used offensively or defensively, tapping down an opponent's stuff at the right time to softlock their turn, stopping a big army of attackers swooping in, or simply acting as a big mana ritual by mana generating permanents. If you also pair this with one of our token makers, you could cast this targeting every permanent on the board and making an absolutely huge token. If the token maker is Maniform Hellkite, an opponent could just be dead on the spot. Smothering Tithe is an important include, because it is not only a very powerful mana engine, but it provides mana of any colour in the form of treasures. Being able to store that mana is important for a control deck, as playing this strategy means casting spells at the right time, not as fast as possible. It will also force your opponents to slow down, because if they don't and get too greedy, you will most likely be able to punish them with all the interaction we run, and close out the game quicker. Our last mana accelerant is Stormkiln Artist, who makes a treasure for us every time we cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell. Similar to Archmage Emeritus, we should be able to accrue a significant amount of mana due to the cost reduction Hanada provides most of our spells, and because it is a treasure, being able to store this is very much to our advantage in game plan. So that is our mana accelerants. Now let's move to the real meat of the deck, the interactive package. Just take note that we've discussed a few of these already. Many cards in the deck have a lot of significant overlap in different areas, and it's what's going to make the deck quite adaptable and powerful to any game you bring it to. First up is Aether Gale, which can bounce up to 6 non-land permanents on the battlefield at the cost of only 2 mana with Hanada out. This is a very efficient rate for what we are getting in return, and can turn a game around very quickly in our favour, especially if our opponent's next turn is spent redeploying what we bounced. Arcane Denial becomes a counterspell for the cost of only 1 mana with our commander out, drawing us one card and our opponent two cards at the next turn's upkeep. Delay is another counter spell that will only cost us one mana to cast and puts three time counters on whatever we counter. Negate also only costs one mana, but only counters non-creature spells. Having to only leave up one mana means we can more easily protect our board state or interact where necessary, and Hanada's tax on our opponent's spells means when we do interact, it is more likely they won't be able to afford to respond. Aurelia's Fury can kill some of our opponent's creatures, tap them all down, and also prevent our opponents from casting non-creature spells that turn. Decks that focus on combat will not see this one coming, as it not only stops them from swinging out, but also leaves them open to the crack back on our turn. And if they are playing a go-wide strategy relying on 1-1s, one this will wipe them all out at the cost of 2 mana. Also, if the control decks can't counter this, it won't matter if they have removal or a board wipe in hand, because they won't be able to use it. This means that Aurelia's Fury can be a mass removal spell, and a finisher when we are all set up and ready to win the next turn. Boral's Expertise can give us an incredible return on our investment, bouncing 3 creatures and or artifacts while also casting a spell with mana value 4 or less from our hand, all at the cost of 2 mana with Hanada out. 
So not only are we slowing down our opponents when casting this card, but we are also accelerating our game plan by casting more expensive spells at a reduced rate. This right here is what makes Hanada such a dangerous control deck, and we are only getting started. Byforce can destroy all of our opponent's artifacts at the cost of only one red mana. Not only is that an insane rate for the cost, but even when we don't have Hanada out, this is still a solid card when casted fairly. Comet Storm becomes a one-sided board wipe, where for two red necks, we can deal X damage to every target we declare, which will almost always be each opponent and all the creatures they control. So in most situations this will be a board wipe, but if one or more opponent's life totals are getting low, this can just take them out of the game, and the thing is, they won't expect it, because most players in most commander games don't expect to die from a non-creature damage spell. After playing against Hanada, this might change. Curse of the Swine can exile any or all of our opponent's creatures and replace them with 2-2 boars, all at the cost of only 2 mana. This will be particularly useful against creature-based graveyard decks performing recursion loops, and if you are lucky and have a card like Comet Storm in hand, you can kill all the boars you just gave your opponents. Deflecting Swat and Fierce Guardianship are necessary protection spells, as after a few games against this deck, your opponents will not let Hanada survive too long. They are also relevant because we are a commander-reliant deck and will often have to tap out to cast her in the early game, so we want to protect her until we can untap and get the engine going. Dismantling Wave is a solid artifact and enchantment removal spell on its own, removing up to one artifact or enchantment for each opponent for the cost of three mana. But with Hanada out, this only costs one mana, so we can cast this early without Hanada if our opponents are getting off to too fast to start, or we can wait till we have Hanada and cast it for a very cheap rate. If you are a control player and this doesn't excite you, I'm not sure what else will. Distorting Wake becomes a 3 mana Cyclonic Rift at sorcery speed, a trade off for the instant speed that we are more than happy to make for the rate. The mana value this card can get to also means our token makers will be very happy to see this cast, because remember that they only care that we cast the spells, not that they resolve, so either way we will get the big token. Heliod's Intervention can be cast for 2 mana to wipe out all of our opponent's artifacts and enchantments at instant speed. Resolving this against specific archetypes, like Enchantress or Artifact Heavy decks, can be devastating if cast at the right time. The additional life gain mode will also come in handy when times get tough and the Artifact Enchantment mode is no longer relevant. March of Swirling Mist can serve a protective or interactive role, similar to Disorder in the Court, but the fact it uses phasing has additional implications. If, for example, an opponent is accruing value every player's turn, say, with a Seedborn Muse or Drum Bellower and some other value piece, phasing them out on their turn means they stop getting that value right until their next turn. The fact it can only cost one mana, yet have such a huge effect will put your opponents in quite the shock when it goes off. Meteor Blast can become a three mana one-sided board wipe that will often deal four damage to each opponent and creature or planeswalker they control, meaning this should take care of most of them. Sublime Epiphany has perhaps more modes than any other spell in the deck, where for just 2 mana it can counter a spell, counter an activated or triggered ability, bounce a non-land permanent, make a token copy of a creature we control, and also draw a card. That is a lot of value and utility for such a low cost, especially considering creatures we could copy, like Dockside, Archmage, Stormkiln, or Goldspan Dragon. Our last interactive spell is one that brings our opponents in on the action, Volcanic Offering. This can cost 3 or 1 mana with Hanada out, depending on the targets. If the opponent we select chooses the same creature and non-basic land as us, this will cost 3 mana, which is still a great rate for what it's removing. But if one opponent is ahead and we can get another to select different targets for each, this can remove 2 creatures and 2 non-basic lands for only 1 mana. The thing I really like about this card is when we are ahead, we are still getting great value casting this for 3 mana. But when we are behind, which should happen more often than not in most commander games, this becomes an incredible card for the rate we are paying, and can really swing the game back in our favour. It is also important to point out that this is an instant, which just makes it that much more powerful. So that is our interactive package. Now if you're wondering, it takes up 28 total deck slots in the deck, which is massive, but we came here to lean into the theme as much as possible, and leaning into the interactive spells is what we're going to do. Now that we've seen all the cards that Hanada takes advantage of, we want ways to be able to recur them, so let's look at our recursion package. Archaeomancer and Ardent Elementalist fulfill the same role, returning an instant or sorcery card to our hand when they ETB. Although at 4 mana they aren't cheap for the effect, most of our protection spells, which we will be discussing next, are actually bounce or flicker spells, so we can get additional value from these creatures. 
In addition, we do have a small package of cards that can clone them, so there is synergy there also. Mavinda, Student's Advocate, can allow us to cast one instant or sorcery card from our graveyard each turn, provided it targets one of our creatures, and exiles it once it hits the graveyard. Fortunately, most of our spells that target can actually target one of our own creatures, so Mavinda will allow us to reuse most of the spells we cast. Considering that Hanada makes most spells only cost 1-3 to three mana, this also means we can reasonably use her ability in each opponent's turn also. We will be feeling very secure having Mavinda out with open mana and a graveyard with cards like Sublime Epiphany or Mystic Confluence in them. Reconstruct History can only cost 2 mana to return an Artifact, Enchantment, Instant, Sorcery and Planeswalker card from our graveyard to our hand. This is quite simply a lot of value for such a low mana cost and can get us back the key pieces we need to shut down our opponents or close out the game. Underworld Breach is our final recursion piece, which for 2 mana can replay any card in our graveyard, provided we pay the escape cost, which is exiling 3 cards from our graveyard in addition to paying the card's mana cost. Although the number is low, we run some very powerful creatures and enchantments in this deck, and being able to get them back could mean the difference between winning and losing. Our graveyard should start to fill up with all the instants and sorceries we will be casting, but we can also fill our yard with the mass draw spells we run like Commander's Insight, Expansion Explosion and Drowning Dreams, the latter of which we can mill ourselves to get Underworld Breach online. So now that we've seen our recursion cards, let's look at the cards that can protect our commander and board state. Apostle's Blessing can be cast at the cost of only 2 life with Hanada out, providing our commander or any other key creature the protection we need to keep them around, block a threatening creature or even get through for our own damage. Eerie Interlude can exile our board of creatures and return them at the next end step, all for the cost of only 1 mana. Semester's End is similar, except they will return with a plus one plus one counter. Both can act as very strong protection pieces in response to single target removal or, even better, a board wipe, but they also have additional utility with our creatures with powerful ETB or target effects like Dockside Extortionist, Archaeomancer, Ardent Elementalist and Goldspan Dragon. Ghostly Flicker performs a similar role to Eerie Interlude and Semester's End, except it can target lands and artifacts in addition to creatures and only flickers them, but it also has great synergy with some creatures in our utility section, so let's move on now from our protection suite and discuss them now. Blatant Thievery is a great steal effect that can take any one permanent from each of our opponents for the cost of only 4 mana. This card is a great one to curve out into after casting our commander, as we can immediately steal the biggest threats or value engines that hit the table. Although this becomes less powerful as the game goes late and 1-2 to two opponents are out of the game, the early to mid game potential is too powerful to pass up. Call the Coppercoats can be a ready-to-go army on demand, where for 4 mana we can make 1-1 soldier tokens based on the number of creatures all of our opponents have. If you can manage to cast this on the end step before your turn and then resolve Surge to Victory, you will be well and truly live in the dream. But beyond that Christmas Land scenario, this will be a great way to create blockers as well as extra chip damage for opponents whose life totals are getting low. Saheeli's Artistry can allow us to copy the best creature and artifact on the battlefield, all at the cost of only 4 mana. Copy effects can be very powerful in many scenarios and even if there aren't many good targets from our opponents, we have enough creatures with powerful abilities so that there should always be viable targets for this to be used on. In addition, if we have Liquid Metal Torque out, we can use its second ability so Saheeli's Artistry can copy enchantments and planeswalkers also. Smoke Spirit's Aid can act as a mana ritual and win condition depending on the circumstances. For just one mana we can enchant any number of creatures so that when they die, they deal 1 damage to their owner and we create a treasure token. This will be one of those very tricky cards that you will always feel good about when it's used appropriately. The ideal times to be cast in this are in response to a board wipe or some similar mass creature removal effect, netting us a lot of mana if the creature board state is huge and potentially dealing a lot of damage. There will be times we will want to even target our own creatures in response to a wipe, just so that we have enough mana next turn to get Hanada back out and in the action. Our last two creatures are actually the secret captains of the deck, earning such a title because they were the first creatures I thought of when Hanada was spoiled, and they were cards I was very excited to build around and synergize with Hanada. The first of those captains is Feather the Redeemed. If we cast a spell that targets at least one of our creatures, we can exile that spell and return it to our hand at the beginning of the next end step. Imagine being able to ghostly flicker a Dockside Extortionist every player's turn, accumulating a mass of treasures, or an Archaeomancer returning all those instants and sorceries in your graveyard back to your hand. Bounce all your opponent's stuff every turn with Distorting Wake, or burn them to ashes by recasting Soulfire Eruption turn after turn. 
The possibilities are endless and exciting. But so are the options with our second captain, Orvar the Allform. This captain will allow us to copy any permanents we control if an instant or sorcery we cast targets at least one of those permanents. Many of our instants and sorceries target creatures, so we could make multiple copies of powerful creatures like Goldspan Dragon or Stormkiln Artist, allowing us to amass a horde of treasure and swing out to kill our opponents. Maybe we've stolen a powerful creature using Blatant Thievery and want to make multiple copies of that creature. Or maybe we just want to bury our opponents in value and interaction by making multiple copies of Ristic Study, Smothering Tithe, and Whirlwind of Thought. The amount of powerful and fun things you can do with these two in this deck is crazy. If you go back and think of all the cards we discussed in this video, you will see how much more powerful they become when either captain is on board. And if you are really lucky and can keep both out, then win or lose you are going to be having a real fun time. So that is our utility package and the captains of the deck. Now let's wrap it up by discussing our lands, as well as any special cards worth mentioning. Although we are getting a heavy discount on many of the spells we are casting with Hanada, a good number of them require at least two pips with the same colour, so we have had to forego a lot of utility lands in favour of fixing our colours. One worth including, however, is Cavern of Souls. After a few games in your local playgroup, or even after some time in the general meta, Hanada will get a reputation of being kill on sight, if not kill very soon at the least. So we want to be able to ensure it resolves, and Cavern of Souls will do that, in addition to providing coloured mana specifically for casting Hanada. Another land we have included is Shatter Skull Smashing, as it is a removal spell that gets enhanced from Hanada's cost reduction ability and still produces coloured mana. The last land is Ottawara Soren City. Blue mana makes up about half the deck's colour requirements on cards, so we could easily afford giving up a basic island to slot this in. And while the rate for its removal isn't something we are super excited about paying for, it is an extra removal piece in a land slot for very little opportunity cost. And that's the deck! Hanada Dawn Crown is a control player's dream come true, and it plays the control game in a way that is different to most. Hanada breaks apart many interactive spells, and the rate of return that you get on many of them means that your opponents will struggle to break through if they're not prepared for it. Hanada also utilises many interactive spells that don't see a lot of play because normally their cost to effect ratio isn't worth it. So if your control game's been a little dull lately, Hanada might breathe some fresh life into it. Well, that marks the end of the video. If you want to see the full deck list, check it out in the description below. And if you want to see the deck list in action, make sure to stop by the channel because we will have gameplay videos up showing how it performs in the wild. Otherwise, thanks for stopping by and I'll catch you next time.